All right, so uh, in this episode of In the East Wing, I am joined by Michael Patrick Mulroy, also known as Mick Mulroy. Um, Mick is uh, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Middle East. Um, he's also a retired CIA paramilitary operations officer in the Special Activity Center and a retired U- U.S. Marine. Um, currently, he is the president of uh, FOGBO, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly here, uh, which is a company that enables international humanitarian efforts. Uh, he's also a senior fellow for uh, Middle East Institute, an ABC News national security analyst, a co-founder of the Lobo Institute, the co-president of End Child Soldiering, and he's also on the board uh, of advisors for Plato's Academy Center and the Aurelius Foundation, Marcus Aurelius. In, in this conversation, we delved into a variety of topics. Um, we talked about the Middle East, we talked about Stoicism, and a few other things here and there. So without further ado, uh, let's hear it from the man himself, Mick Leroy. Mick, it's been, gosh, I don't remember last time we uh, had a conversation together, but I think, uh, you know, this is the third time uh, you're on my show, so I want to welcome you again. Thank you for joining me. Great to be with you, Abdullah. And I think even since yesterday, a lot has happened. So I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Oh yeah, things absolutely. Are happening fast in the world. Yeah, things are things are changing. I mean, I um, I think uh, you know, obviously, Middle East. You know, we're just that's the core. Uh, that's the main focus. And I do also want to say that um, we'll try, you know, as much as we can to go over a couple of things pertaining to the Middle East, and we'll uh, delve into a little bit of stoicism here and there. So for the for those listening, all right, yeah, they, they're gonna they're gonna get a couple of gift to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Mick, uh, you know, you were for a while you were involved. You, you worked under Secretary Mattis, right, uh, at the at the. Department of Defense, uh, and you were uh, involved, you were the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for the Middle East. And I'm sure at the time, uh, things were very different than what we're seeing today. Um, so with 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 a, um, with a, a regional war perhaps breaking up soon, hopefully not, and with a situation in the Middle East that's very, very intense, um, what would you say things would sort of look like if you were still involved with the Pentagon? How different would it be what you would be doing and, and you know, in terms of pressure and workload? Say you're still involved, like it would probably be very different than, you know, since the last time you were in the inside. Sure. I mean, that that is an interesting question. I haven't had that question asked yet. <laughs> uh, I did work, I had the privilege to work for both uh, Secretary Mattis and, and Secretary Asper, mm-hmm. uh, both uh, great Americans and uh, uh, really cool to work with, to be honest. And, uh, and I, you know, as far as what the difference would be, you know, I think one thing that people would find a bit surprising, at least from my perspective, is U.S. foreign policy does change, but doesn't change as much as you think it does. Right. And, and obviously the news is going to highlight the changes, the differences and not so much what stays the same and remains the same. And I think partly because when when people get into power, uh, you know, you have new president, for example, um, oftentimes they don't know what they don't know. And when they get in there, they think something, they have a preconceived notion of what should change. And then the first intel briefing they get from the CIA, they go, oh, wait, didn't know that. Of course you didn't know that, because like, especially now, we get a lot of people that come from outside of government, and we have some people that come from outside of government. So I think the first thing I'd say is um, a lot of U.S. foreign policy stays consistent. People just don't talk about it because what's to talk about? It doesn't make news if you don't change, right? Uh, but it's very consistent, and, and, and the other part of that is because there is a group of professional policymakers, um, I was in a, I'm not a political person. I don't support a party, I'm, you know, middle of the road ideologically, if you will. I did it. I, I essentially took the policy position because, you know, I'm a former Marine. And when General Mattis asked you to 
do something, you do it, right? <laughs> my son said that. He was a Marine as well. He's like, well, Dad, you don't really have a choice, so yeah. you're going to have to put, put your Montana plans on hold for a uh, few years. Um, but there is politically appointed policymakers, and then there's policymakers that are consistent across administrations, uh, both at the NSC, at the State Department, mm -hmm. and at the Pentagon, and also at Treasury, I imagine, and Energy and all that, but I'm more focused on uh, national security type stuff. And they are consistent. And now they ultimately are told, you know, if policy changes, this is, but if policy doesn't change, then the consistency is right there with them. And the history and the knowledge and how everything's transferred from administration to administration, even if it's a Republican or a Democrat or Democrat to Republican, um, stays consistent unless there's a need to change it. So, uh, that's the first part of my answer. Second part is, although I was in a senior Pentagon uh, policymaking position, and you know I had my say, and certainly this, both secretaries allowed their deputies, uh, assistant secretaries, to have a say in policy. Uh, ultimately, if if uh, that wasn't the ultimate decision over at the White House, guess whose opinion doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, mine, right? Or anybody in my position, right? So, uh, and, and oftentimes that's how it happened, even to the secretary, right? I mean, I, I, I'm not telling any secrets. I mean, the secretary resigned in protest to uh, Secretary Mattis resigned in protest to the uh, abrupt decision to essentially abandon our partners in the SDF and depart. Uh, although that didn't actually happen, uh, we still have people with the SDF, but um, Secretary Mattis felt that that type of uh, disloyalty to partners, and I agree with them, uh, was unacceptable. Yeah. So that shows you that even up to the secretary level, so the cabinet level, um, um, ultimately the president's making the decision. So what would be the difference? I think, I think you know, I would what I would have agreed with and disagreed with uh, from this administration is I have agreed with the U.S. leading the charge on support for Ukraine. Uh, totally. If anything, I would have pushed and ad I wasn't in the, that part of the uh, geo spectrum. But if they were asking me, I would have said, look, there's no reason to drag out giving them F-16s and M1 Abrams, um, especially since we all know we're going to do it. So rather than have this public debate, let's just do it all at once. So these guys can not just survive, they can succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, when looking at it in total, I think the U.S., President Biden, his secretaries uh, have led the international community in the support that Ukraine deserves. Uh, and this this odd uh, anti-Ukrainian uh, sentiment on the far right is just baffling to me how that party of Reagan can now be in many ways a pro-Russian element in the political political spectrum. Where I would disagree uh, uh, would be the withdrawal from Afghanistan, mm. uh, both from the perspective that we didn't have to fully withdraw. We were essentially not in combat roles anymore. And then, of course, how we withdrew was a national uh, embarrassment. And then I have mixed feelings on the, uh, on the Middle East, the current Middle East issue with Gaza and stuff. But... I'll stop there and see if you have any specifics <laughs> uh, on that because it's a it's a broad topic, right? It is. It is. Yeah. Ramble. <laughs> yeah. There's um. Just earlier, you mentioned the SDF. I just maybe for our viewers to know, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces. That's that's what we're referring to. SDF. Yeah. Um, yes. That's right. Yeah. So uh, well, you mentioned Afghanistan, and and I think there's um earlier. I think this morning I was looking into um. I realized there was an article published in 2010 by Professor Georgetown, and they were talking about how essentially it was trying to say that um, the model of clear, hold, build, transfer might not be successful. That was, you know, back in 2010, she was writing about the Obama administration's decision to, you know, it's, uh, to sort of um, to mitigate, I guess, American presence and to trans, you know, after you're done with the insurgency, just transfer it to, you know, the Afghans, let them handle it. Um, you see maybe a sort of a parallel, maybe, with uh, perhaps the tactics that are be maybe being used by the IDF in Gaza, right? Maybe 
that that w- would that be considered a counterinsurgency model? And if 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 it would be, what what is what are they maybe perhaps overlooking, or uh, can they fall into a similar situation to that where you find yourself on the ground for almost twenty years and then you realize uh, this is not going anywhere? Well, the, to start with, Abdullah, I mean, hopefully all countries have the capacity to learn from other countries' experiences, right? That, that's what, uh, that's the definition of intelligence for many, is the ability to learn from other people's mistakes. Uh, by, I think the U.S., if the U.S., and it's easy to be an armchair quarterback looking back, so I'll start with that. I spent two and a half years uh, on the ground in Afghanistan. Mm. Um Looking back, I'd say going forward, the U.S. the U.S. definitely had a reason to go into Afghanistan. Obviously, the terrorist group Al Qaeda was was essentially housed there and protected by the Taliban that did 9/11. I think the U.S. and I did think this at the time should have focused primarily on the mission that brought us there, which was counterterrorism. Mm-hmm. We should have built the capacity of your Af- Afghans to. Uh, fight their own terrorist component, to have their own elections. And then we should have just been part of the international community when it comes to building up the country, right? Nation building, right. but not the sole country and, and basically take 90% of our international uh, aid and put it into one country, mm. right? Um, I think the international community should have led that. We should have participated. We should have contributed our fair share, but we essentially went all in and now we, and then turned it over to the very group that housed the town, the Al Qaeda terrorist group that attacked us. And they are worse than they ever were. And their humanity, human rights, uh, record to date is abysmal. In fact, it was, it's probably worse than it was before we got there, uh, after the attacks. So I think I think what the U.S. should learn is we have to realize the reason why we go into a country and we have to be hesitant to do so only when necessary. Iraq would be a good example of what not to do, hmm. right? Try to attach it to 9-11 and then just decide to invade a country. But Afghan, I think, was valid. But then have a realistic uh, goal. So what can be done? Because... If you leave and it collapsed because they can't, for example, this is a logistic thing. So if you build all these places that have to be continuously resupplied by aerial delivery, and you know that's not going to last past the United States, like it's a virtual certainty. Mm-hmm. That's a simple example. But if if you're thinking like I'm trying to build a nation, but I'm building it off of my model, including the military, and then when we're not here, that model can't sustain itself, it's a waste of time right. unless you intend to be there forever which we don't. So I, I would say from that perspective, we should have very much refined our goals. We should have participated in the international community's effort to, to you know, to have a elected government and uh, that promotes human rights, but not be the primary because we should be doing that everywhere and we can't do it everywhere. If we're focused. But on your question, Abdel, on whether the Israelis... You know, they're not going to build anything. Mm. I, it's, it, you know, from my experience, and I'm involved with the humanitarian uh, efforts, enabling humanitarian efforts on the ground there and in other countries. And it does look like their their plan right now is, you know, clear for sure. Yeah. Hold somewhat. Okay. They're having to re-clear a lot of places. Okay. Build. I haven't seen any of that. Uh, and then turn over, that's the other issue they're unlikely to do because they haven't, they, from their perspective, they don't see any form of government that's worth handing anything over to. They're certainly not going to do it to a remnant of Hamas's rule. So the build part, I mean, the clear part is clearly going on. Mm-hmm. The hold to a lesser extent and then the, and then the other two, uh, build and turn over. There's no plan, to my knowledge, and I haven't seen it coming from anybody, to do the latter. Ooh. And you said you were involved in the humanitarian effort and, and knowing that there might not be, you know, past phase two of holding, which is sort of, you know, uh, not 
it's not a you know concrete yet the plans to hold knowing that past that phase there's nothing to sort of nothing no positive indications how does that sort of um translate when you're involved in this humanitarian effort that is um that will remain ongoing without perhaps an end goal right like how did you know what do you yeah that's a, uh, position that's to a be good in. question yeah that's a it is like so from the humanitarian and where we enable uh humanitarian groups to do what they do in gaza and uh proud to do so but from that perspective it does mean that there is essentially no end in sight with the need uh, in Gaza, right? The 80 plus percent of the buildings and dwellings have been destroyed to the point of uh, they can't be occupied. Yeah. Um, there is no real means to produce food internally. Uh, the hospitals are non-functioning. So there is, this is going to be a permanent humanitarian at the basic level effort in Gaza for the foreseeable future. Mm. Uh, what could change that? Well, uh, I know people uh, say it. Uh, some people don't want to hear it, but there has to be a diplomatic path toward um, a solution that ends with two nation states that live peacefully beside each other, of which both uh, the governments are responsive to their people, not a foreign entity like Iran, and are driven to provide a better future economically, security, educationally, um, to their people. That needs to be the case. And if, uh, that's going to require an international effort, right? If, if we're all expecting this to be done by the Israelis, um, it's not going to happen. Mm. Well, they don't even have the capacity to make it happen. It really does require all the nations in the region to either become actively involved, or in the case of Iraq, Iran, actively uninvolved, uh, unless they're going to do something positive, which is doubtful. But, you know, led by the Gulf states, U.S. playing a part, obviously, uh, the European partners playing a part, and, and really looking at how to get to a place where um, this isn't just a repetitive recycling conflict, where the goal of the political entities is to simply destroy the other uh, entity uh, or country in the region, Israel. Mm -hmm. It's easier, I mean, it's easier said than done. I'll start with that. But if you're not even saying it, then we're going nowhere. <laughs> right. Like we're not going anywhere. And there's too many entities outside of Gaza or the West Bank for that matter, who are perfectly fine for using this as their own political. And they don't really care about uh, uh, the lot of the Palestinian people going forward. They would, just like the proxy forces in general, Iran would be fully willing to fight to the last proxy force, mm -hmm. right? And we're seeing that in Hezbollah right now. I mean, I don't think you could see any more of an example of that. Right. Anyway, so that's all. That's that's you got to start by set, setting out what where the end state, and then there needs to be an all hands international effort to get to that end state once it's agreed. To. Mm. There's a now here. I don't know if it's if it's right or accurate to have maybe um, the U.S. experience as a point of reference, but I'll try here to maybe paint a rough sketch, and you tell me where you would perhaps agree or or maybe disagree. So um, the, the Israeli operation started in Gaza after October seventh, and then now it is sort of shifting to Lebanon, and you hear the rhetoric, obviously, from many um, uh, officials in the Israeli government saying that the shift is now toward Lebanon, right? There's a fair bit of, uh, I guess, um, I guess the, the focus is no longer, even though their operation in Gaza is still ongoing, there's, there's you know, more, more attention being paid to Lebanon and Hezbollah. And this is sort of reminiscent of, I don't, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but sort of, Afghanistan and Iraq, right? You have you start off with Afghanistan, and then you, um, you know, you got 2003 invasion of Iraq, and then you have a surge, and then the focus sort of shifts, and you're sort of torn between these different, um, I guess, uh, fronts, and you don't. 
it's like you're managing two wars at once, and that's that would be it's like you're stretching yourself too thin, and it's very difficult. And so here I, I want to see if you sort of um, maybe agree with that assessment or you see it differently, as in like the U.S. point of reference might not be accurate, as, as this is perhaps a unique case and should be treated on its own. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know where you uh, stand on that. So I could see the, uh, the connections mm. uh, that you're making, but I think from the differences would be this. The the U.S. tried to connect them, hmm. right? The U.S. tried to say, oh, you know, Saddam houses some Al Qaeda guys. So, yeah, because of 9 11, we're going to, that came out of Afghanistan, supported by Al Qaeda, housed by the Taliban, we're going to go to Iraq and invade and take down Saddam, who was a secular dictator, right? right. Who actually hated Al Qaeda because he was a threat to him. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, they were a threat to him. Now, I was involved in Operation Viking Hammer, where there was a, a, uh, a Al Qaeda linked group called Ansar al Islam in northern, northeastern Iraq, but that was outside of the control of Sudan, yeah. of Sudan. Hmm. Right. So the U.S. attempted to t attach the two. And I think history looked at that and said, eh, no, that you guys wanted to use 9-11 to build a coalition to do something you want to do separately, you know, because we didn't finish the job in the 90s uh, or whatever the neoconservatives were, were thinking there. But I think history, history will say they weren't linked. You essentially started a war. Um, and I mean, we could go down that rabbit hole of how it's left Iraq, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Iran and all that. But uh, to stay on your point of your question, with Israel's perspective, there is a link. So who is the link? Iran. Iran started Hezbollah. It wasn't just a proxy force. The IRGC Quds Force started Hezbollah. They were the original, uh, you know, founding you know, fathers of Hezbollah. Mm. They supported Hamas. Ninety percent of their military support came from Iran. They support uh, the Houthis. Right. And then you could go on to some of the militias in Syria and Iraq. But those three main groups, as you can see right now, were in coordination against Israel. So that's not a coincidence. And I've been going to Israel uh, quite a bit because a lot of our uh, human humanitarian efforts uh, about, as you probably know, Jerusalem is a big hub for mm -hmm. NGOs. Um, the Israelis have been telling us since November that they expected uh, Lebanon to happen. Because the he Hezbollah has been launching attacks against Israel since October 8th. October 8th, right? right. So 9,000 rockets and missiles, 60,000 Israelis displaced. Their perspective, if the, if anybody has listened to them, and it was from, you know, generals I know down to the bartender who was a reservist that just got back from Gaza, right? And I know a lot of bartenders, I have to tell you. I'm an Irish guy. <laughs> but... And I usually get my info for them. And they usually have better info. <laughs> used to be, uh, used to be uh, straight up. Um, they were telling me in November, look, as soon as we get Gaza to a place there it, where it's, you know, we think we can, we're going to have to address the northern border and we're going to have to go in if they don't stop shooting at us. Mm. Because it's politically impossible to accept that the one third of your country is now uh, off limits to your citizens, right? Right. Um, and so, I mean, you could certainly see it coming. And I think the U.S. has a bit of a different perspective on Hezbollah. One, they've killed more Americans than any other uh, terrorist group other than Al Qaeda. Yeah. Two, although they had a, a have an issue, they us the U.S. government has an issue, you know, with how the war has been executed in Gaza. There's considerable civilian casualties and humanitarian aid uh, has had its issues. It's very difficult for the U.S. to say, well, don't invade southern Lebanon, mm. right? Because let's face it, any American would say, like, you can see uh, there's Canada over that now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 40 minutes away, right? So right behind me. Now, I don't think Canada is going to start setting rockets and missiles into Montana. But just hypothetically, say they did on October 8th, 
The U.S. would probably invade on October 9th. Right. Right. Let's face it. We all know that to be true. No matter what side of the political aisle you're on, mm-hmm. the U.S. would put up with being rocketed from a foreign terrorist group from a neighboring country for like 24 hours. And, you know, the 101st Airborne would be flying over that border. Mm-hmm. So I and I, I'm not being tongue in cheek. Right. But it's true. Yeah. Like the U.S. to say, oh, no, just let 9000 rockets and missiles land on your settlements in the northern part of your country and just suck it up because we don't want to expand the war. I mean, we can say that, but, it, you know, they can turn around and say, you're full of it. You would you wouldn't do that. Mm. You, no country would. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult. It's difficult for the U.S. to they can certainly critique how war these conflicts are being executed, particularly in Gaza. 41,000, maybe 42,000 now. Uh, if you, if you're tracking the numbers and you believe the God, I mean, the Hamas controlled, it's got to be close to that. And I think the U.S. is believed it's close to that. Yeah. You could have the issue there, but to have the issue of them defending themselves is just it's nonsensical and it's not believable. Right. Uh, we wouldn't put up with it for a day. Yeah. And I think there's a good point you make earlier about how you know, the U.S. might have issues with how the Israelis are executing their operation. And they might have reservations about, might have reservations about, you know, Israelis going into Lebanon. But because it's Hezbollah, that triggers a historical memory, you know, starting from the 80s, right? In 1982, you know, the Marine Barak's explosion, and then over the years, you know, these different um, uh, terrorist acts. That makes it, that puts the U.S. in a very tough spot. You know, it's it's sort of maybe not the best time to carry out an operation against Hezbollah. But at the same time, the U.S. might feel like, well, you know, it, at the end of the day, this, 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 this terrorist entity has done a lot against us. And if this is the opportunity to maybe go after them, I mean that that would probably be the U.S. sort of perspective, and one can can understand why that is. You know, it's like you can, it's it's a rational or logical sort of reaction, I would say. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, uh, Fawad Shakur was believed to be one of the main architects behind the Marine barracks bombings that you just referenced. Mm-hmm. When when the Israelis killed him, the first thing most of my friends said, "Wait a minute, he was in Beirut." We've had a $7 million bounty for this guy for how many years? That was 1980, isn't that early 1980? Yeah. So, you know, for, you know, a lot of, you know, you know I'm a former Marine, but you don't have to be a former Marine to, as you just be an American, to want to see them. Like, why was that guy still wandering around in Beirut? Isn't our embassy in Beirut? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a little shocking, to be honest. So I think, I think Americans in general, which includes senior policymakers from both sides of the aisle, are a little more hesitant to say, Okay. Um, they attacked. I mean, maybe they attacked on October eighth. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't they? You know, not that it would ever be really justified. But let's. I mean, let, let's look at that. So it wasn't that Israel went in, was heavy handed, uh, and that they disagreed with how Israel was prosecuting the war against Hezbollah because it's failing casualties. They started attacking them on August eighth. October eighth. Mm-hmm. Like they haven't even recovered from the the terrorist attack on October seventh. Right. So it had really right. nothing to do with how Israel was prosecuting war. Yeah. It was like. We're part of the attack on Israel. Huh. Essentially, it's the same terrorist attack. Yeah. So, you know, I've taught, and I've, I have friends on both sides of the aisle, and I have friends that were on, uh, I'm not on either side, but were in the Biden administration in my position. Mm. Good friends. And most of them, I think, are very consistent uh, in the position I was in, but very consistent with what I'm saying right now. Right. Uh, I think I think that is, uh, when it comes to Hezbollah, and then, of course, of course, there's the bit of envy from being a former CIA person who's seen just the level of decomp- decomp- decapitation strikes in sequence is astonishing. Yeah. Like somebody who, is, who has been involved in this from the U.S. side, their ability to find, locate, fix, and finish uh, senior leaders is just oh, yeah. astonishing. Oh, yeah. It's, it is astonishing. It's got to be... Uh, very worrisome, of course, to Hezbollah or Iran. Right. Um, but anyway, yeah, with with yeah. with you there's know, a multi facet. Yeah. yeah, no, that's one thing I, I was really uh, like all of the 
prominent Hezbollah figures, like the up the, up the chain of command. I mean, all of those were practically eliminated. I mean, that's, I mean that that yes yeah no that that's a very major. That's I I, I honestly yeah I'm astonished as well. I'm like man, this is so. This is you know fascinating. The level of of you know the targeting, you know the the. The level of targeted, sophist sophisticated targeting, I should probably call it. That's that's very, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. And I, and I'd be, I'd, I'd be interested to know how you see, you know, you know, the long term or maybe short term impact of of these different, you know, um, targeted operations against uh, these, you know, figures up the chain of command. Like, where would you uh, see the impact of that short term and long term? With obviously, you know, Nasrallah also, uh, you know, being assassinated. I mean, that's a big deal. You know, that's that's also a huge deal. So, where, where do you see sort of what are some of the long term, short term effects of that? Another good question, Abdullah. I've, I've seen this play out with a lot of uh, policy folks um, yeah. on the discussions of whether decapitation strikes are as effective as some would say. Uh, so first of all, I'd say they never really solve the issue, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, mm -hmm. right? So there's several things. One, leadership of any group, even a terrorist group, uh, is important. Yeah. People follow them. People take their lead. They make the decisions on whether to stop attacking. They make a decision on whether to, to attack. Uh, they make a decision on who to attack. You know, whether it's let's go after the military targets or let's actually go after civilians. So they're important to remove from the battle space, just like any military commander. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wouldn't go into war and say, let's leave all the generals because <laughs> that would be dumb as hell. No person right? ever so, heard like, those words. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, like, no, let's just kill the privates. Let's just kill the privates in the, in the fighting positions that yeah. have nothing to do with making, you know, the decisions or whether they're at war. I mean, nobody would say that. Yeah. So, I mean, just put that in the same context, not taking out the leaders is just uh, not uh, smart. Mm. The other part is like Safadine, right? So uh, Nasrallah's uh, cousin who, uh, according to reports, uh, Iran has designated as his replacement since 2006. Mm. He has a uncanny resemblance, even speaks like him and all this stuff. Apparently he was killed yesterday. Oh yeah. They right? lost contact so, with him. There were reports that right. they lost contact with them. Yeah. Right. So how many other people are going to be put, you know, shoving their hands up in the air to be the next Nasrallah? Right. It, there is a deterrent effect. Yeah. Right. Um, it's like, hey, you know, I'm pretty happy being number four. Uh, number four is still on the list. But when you go to number one, you're on the number one. You're on the list. Exactly. Uh, as number one. Yeah. Right. So there's also, so one, it's like a no brainer when it comes to tactical is to take a leader out. Two, it, there is a hesitation, and you can see it, I'm sure, when they're like looking around the room and nobody's holding their hand up. If there's anybody left in the room, <laughs> um, and, and the other uh, a part is, it is important to show progress militarily to push diplomacy. You know, people often say, "Well, only diplomacy matters." Well, I'm here to tell you. If you have no force behind your, your diplomacy, you have no diplomacy. Mm. Nobody cares about the, the country that has no force to, to actually impose its policy, its foreign policy, and just shows up to talk diplomacy. Right. I mean, just think about it in history. Yeah. Right? I do think diplomacy should leave. I uh, lead. I do think uh, the military should be there to support diplomacy. But if you don't have the military... I mean, just think about the United States without the United States military. It's just economy. Yeah. <laughs> just an economy, right? So that's plus. That is a good point. Yeah. But how many, you know, are going to really care what we have to say when it comes to uh, war and peace? Right? They're going to be like, man, eh, whatever. You know, go be Switzerland. So I, I would say that the that that falls into it. If we're making strikes, mm -hmm. we got we or not we at all actually. Uh, Israel has Hezbollah. Shaking in their boots right now. Even even some of the people I talk about that are close to them and are more inclined to their position are acknowledging it on foreign media. Yeah, like this is they don't know you know to pick up a radio, a pager, a cell phone. A, you know, they're 
they because of the military and the covert operations in Mossad, they have them seriously wrapped. Right. So it is it is never going to be a be, be all end all. It should never lead. We should always try to lead with diplomacy. But the military is there to back up diplomacy and give it some some actual clout. Mm. Uh, and I think most diplomats would acknowledge that, yeah. if not actually promote it. And would you think that also applies to uh, ownership or possession of nuclear weapons and its impact or leverage it has over, say, negotiations and diplomacy? Yeah, good questions. <laughs> that is that is a that is kind of a. I don't know if Gordian Knot is actually the right. It's a dilemma, oh. right? So uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday, um, reporter, and I just, you know, they're like, well, will Iran seek a nuclear weapon? And, you know, it's always good to put yourself in their position, even if you don't want to. Yeah. You know, if you were Iran right now and you're looking at the Libyan model and the North Korean model, one dude ended up dead in a ditch. Right. That was the dude that decided, yeah, I'll give up my nuclear program because the United States asked me to. Yeah. Right. And, and which I, I'm happy he did. And I think the United States should have asked him. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other guy is still trouncing around with military parades and fancy trains. Right. So, rocket man. you know, living the life of luxury, rocket man. Right. And getting love letters from the president of the United States. <laughs> so, you know, I wish that wasn't the case. But if, just from a purely regime regime survival perspective, if I was, uh, you know, I won't even put me there. But if I, you know, I'm sure that the supreme leader and the leader of the IRGC uh, is saying, "Look, if we want to make sure we survive, we've got to get to a nuclear weapon." Yeah. Period. It's going to be a totally different dynamic when it comes to should we take out the entire energy. You know, system in Iran. Should we take out the, you know, all that stuff is a different calculation when Iran's proven their ability to have a nuclear weapon and deliver it. Mm. It's a horrible thing. The world should not want a, a nuclear armed Iran, but Iran probably wants a nuclear armed Iran. Yeah, especially so, at this stage. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oof. You know, there's no, I don't think there's ever any way. To transition to stoicism or just how does one start a conversation there's no perfect way to transition to it <laughs> yeah the world needs no more stoics that's my that's my respect mm, gosh yeah i was um when was let me ask you this before I, I i i i start you know we can start talking about stoicism when was the last time you were in greece Ah, so i was there because uh we did a lot uh, hubbed out of there in Cyprus, uh-huh. by the way. Cy- the, the port that we hubbed out of in Cyprus is called Larnaca. Its historic name is Citium. Oh. Citium was where the founder of Stoicism was actually from. Oh. Um, it's unclear whether he was Phoenician, which is you know modern day, I suppose, Lebanon, right. or Greek. But he was, you know, not to go, not you know, start me, wind me up on Stoicism. He came there. That's where I stayed. To help our efforts into uh, Gaza, yeah. but that was where he from. He got in a shipwreck off the coast of uh, Piraeus, which is the port city of Athens. Swam to shore with nothing. He was a rich guy, and all of a sudden, all of his stuff went to the bottom of the sea, oh. and that's where Stoicism started from a wealthy person who went to nothing and decided that maybe there was more to life than material yeah. wealth. My goodness. Wow. Yes, so I was in Greece recently. Oh actually. yeah, and Cyprus, right? Greek Cyprus for, for well, it had to do with with the floating pier operation, I think. J Lots. Uh, That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. We supported. We didn't ask for it, but God bless them, they sent it, and uh, the military did uh, Herculean effort to make it successful, and we helped by making sure that it was safely back and forth. I mean, literally, physically, with our. Uh, uh, maritime assets, yeah. getting it back in port to Ashdod to avoid the weather, and then getting it back in place. Right, that's what, that's what we did, and we put eleven hundred tons of uh, food across it uh, ourselves, or the food that we acquired. Oh, eleven hundred tons from Cyprus! Wow, from Cyprus, yes, we actually had the uh, our logistics officer Roger convinced uh, the Cypriot millers, those that make flour. Mm. Uh, to work on the weekends because they only created enough 
flour for Cypriots. Like, why would they make? Yeah. So we couldn't, they, they could not feed their own people. So they had to work on all the weekends. And they did. That's how they, nice. it was 1,100 tons primarily of enriched, uh, rich flour. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah. So I was, um, I was reading about, what was his name? Epicurus. No, not Epicurus. Uh, Epicurus would be. He's a big, was, big one. Yeah, but he wasn't a Stoic. And Sheridan? No, no. No, he was a Stoic, for sure. Oh, Epicurus? Epicurus. Oh, Epicurus. You're, Epicurus you're, I, was, yeah. I would think Epictetus. Epictetus, yeah. yeah that's... Epictetus was a famous Stoic. Yes, yeah, sorry. He was born a slave. Epicurus, right? He's, he was an. Epictetus was, absolutely. Uh-huh. In fact, his name really means slave. They oh. don't know his name. Oh. Yeah, that's that's it means one that's owned or something that means slave. Mm. So Epictetus is a is a stalwart of, of uh, uh, Stoics. Yeah, uh, for sure. Right. He wrote Enchiridion, the Handbook. But you said Epictetus. Sorry, I just I just heard Ep, Ep, uh, Epicurus. Epicurean. Yeah. Epicurean started another philosophy. All of it comes from the Socratic philosophy. Right. So, so Stoicism does, obviously, Aristotle does, mm. Plato, and then uh, the Epicureans, the Cynics, for example, and the Cynics were kind of uh, between so- Socratic philosophy and Stoicism, mm. because Zeno started as a Cynic, and then he he basically took that and he offshooted it in the Stoicism. Yeah. And I'll start with, I've been a lifelong Stoic. Um, I know it's really popular now, but I have been since I was a kid. But I'm not a you know a professional you know PhD in philosophy. So right. I come at it from the 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 average dude uh, <laughs> side. But for the average dude, I I would say I, I know a lot about stoicism because I've been studying it my whole life. Mm. Well, here's one thing that I really I think that fascinated me about um, Epictetus. He one of his core beliefs is that you don't have sort of control over maybe external events and you have to accept whatever happens for what it is. Like, you you know, just accept it, be patient, and essentially uh, maintain, I guess, a level of self-composure, whatever happens. And he was born into, you know, slavery, but you compare that to the original figure you told me about who founded Stoicism. He was born rich, but then he became poor. And the contrast is that this guy, right. Epictetus, was born poor, but he, he he accepted it. You know, he was a slave. Obviously, he wouldn't have a lot of, you know, he's not, he doesn't come from a family of means or background that's affluent, but he, he accepted it for what it is. Um, and that, it's, it's interesting that you see a different strand here, right? I mean, a different... I wouldn't say entirely different perspective, but people coming at it from different lifestyles or backgrounds and still sort of, you know, finding a level of, of connection to the concept. I mean, wh- what do you think of that? So I think this is, to many, why Stoicism is so attractive. Mm-hmm. Um, you have Marcus Aurelius, you know, so quite arguably, not only was the most powerful man in the world, but might have been the most powerful man that ever will live. Because we don't have Roman emperors right anymore. Right. Um, and yet he spent most of his time not only being a good leader from the front, but us actually like um, troubling himself with being a better person. Mm. So when you read the meditations, it was just his notes to himself. It's not a book. He never intended it to be published. He actually told his staff, burn it. They just didn't. Um, so you have the, the, the potentially the most powerful man that ever lived. Next, and he's and who does he study? He studies Epictetus, the slave. Wow, right? Who does he revere? The slave. Gosh, right? Um, so that's that's a, a you know that's why a lot of people. So, and then another part of this is Zeno, who as you referenced, is a was a really wealthy person who then became a really not wealthy person. I'm sure they didn't have insurance back then. Uh, <laughs> he started as a cynic. Cynics, they don't just not value wealth; they just don't like it or at, at the time. So they're the guys that lived in the, you know, lived with nothing. They just had a bowl. Of, and then I think he started with that and then said, Hey, you know, this only works if other people are willing to like give you food. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So um, the Stoics aren't against 
material things. They realize that's important. They realize that like working is a sense of purpose. Uh, having things is fine. Yeah. Um, but it's not who you are, right? That's why you go to a lot of these stoic con uh, conferences and you'll see, you know, the average uh, guy who, uh, you know, blue collar guy, but you also see a millionaires and billionaires. Hmm. Um, you see across the spectrum. And it's not that they are opposed to people who, you know, do uh, really well economically for themselves. Yeah. But the question then is the only thing necessary for a good life is to do, is to be a good person and do good things. So what is the billionaire doing? Right. If they're just like buying up the next, you know, whatever they're buying, then they're not, a, they're not really, it's called eudaimonia. It's the kind of the good life is, it's just a Greek term for it. Yeah. Um, similar to Nirvana, if you're, if you uh, have ever studied Buddhism, I've heard, similar. Yeah, I've heard some, um, some people saying, yeah, you die, my professor used to say you're daimonia. I was like, how does that, how does that even, what's he's right? probably saying it right. Right. Cause uh, I, most of mine is, <laughs> is okay. from reading. It's all right. It's from reading. And I've and actually, I've talked to a lot of Greeks about this and they pronounce it different than both. Right. Ooh. Um, cause it's Greek and they're speaking Greek. Right. Um, but the point being it is there's nothing wrong with wealth, but it really is, you know, whether you have a dollar in your bank account or a billion dollars to a stoic, one isn't a better person than the other. It just isn't, mm. you know, if, it depends on what you're doing, Yeah. you know, and, in which you, and, and so that's now uh, stoicism really started with multifacets, you know, propositional logic, um, virtue ethics, mm. uh, you know, the, the, the stoic ethics, you know, all the cardinal virtues and such. And this, Strong belief that you should live in uh, uh, compliance, if you will, with nature. That's right. Yeah. Today, it's mostly focused on the virtue ethics part, which is fine, but it always has been. Uh, and it, in, in, in concert with nature also includes this really strong belief that you should lead with science, mm. you know, the natural sciences, right? You, not everybody should be a scientist necessarily. And Interesting enough, my dad was a scientist. I think that's one of the reasons why he uh, taught me virtue ethics through Stoicism. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah. anyway, yeah. that's that was what Stoicism was usually start, founded much broader in terms of what they were interested in. Now it's mostly virtue ethics, but I think I think uh, that's important too. Mm. You know, one, one of the interesting things I read was that um, when... Uh, Constantine, Emperor Constantine converted uh, to Christianity and then obviously became sort of like the state religion, right? Um, the Stoic philosophy or Stoics in general started sort of fizzling away with the emergence of Christianity and it being a state religion. So you have people sort of betting um, on um, or switching well, maybe they still remain Stoics, but they're but they're you know essentially Christian, and they believe in you know in their salvation through Christ, and that is what they've dedicated their lives toward. Um, and you see how I guess today there's a resurgence of Stoicism, and you wonder sometimes why that is. Right in the beginning, you know, not, you know, back in, in in the fourth century, right, third century, I think that's when Constantine was was mm -hmm. uh, emperor. That's when it mm -hmm. sort of started fizzling away a little bit, but then today you see a resurgence. And, you know, I wonder, wonder what, what we, you would attribute the reasons to that uh, for, you know, for, for such a resurgence. You, you know your stuff. You really do know your stuff. <laughs> I, I think, um, a little bit of preparation like most yeah, of, yeah, you did, you know, a lot of preparation. So if you think about Paul and he went around all these Greek um, settlements, mm. most of them were Stoics that he was preaching uh, Christianity. To. Right. Now, there's nothing in Stoicism, to my knowledge, and again, I'm not, you know, a Princeton professor of philosophy or anything. There's nothing in Stoicism that you can be Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, and, and be a Stoic. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if we back up a bit, the early Stoics believed in uh, God. Mm. You don't have to to be a Stoic. You'd be atheist too, by the way, or agnostic or whatever. Um, but the the early Stoics definitely believed in God, but they believed in a God that. I think most people would say is a more modern interpretation. Okay. Uh, the one my dad uh, described it, who, by the way, was a Jesuit priest before he became a scientist. Oh. Where my dad described it, um, you know, most 
religions view God as the watchmaker, whereas Stoics viewed God as the watch. Mm. If you can get the example, like in other words, God is the composition of everything. That's essentially what Stoics, early Stoics, uh, believed in. Right. It was God was the the sum of all parts, and the all parts was everything in the universe. Interesting. Right. So rather than some separate entity that created, uh, that's the watchmaker. At least what my dad used to explain it. But worked for me. Um, but when Paul and other uh, apostles were preaching, they were preaching to a lot of Stoics. Mm. Um, but the Stoicism was primarily not a religion. It's not a religion. Um, and it's not necessarily in opposition, but I do think you're right. I think a lot of them, they're like, oh, like eternal salvation, heaven, all these things. That's, I mean, Stoicism doesn't really promise anything. Uh, so I can see why that would be a draw, of course, and still is. And I know plenty of, especially Catholics, but I know plenty of Christian Stoics. Um, it's very, it's very much in line. And early Christianity's philosophy was heavily influenced by Stoicism. In fact, it was Christians who even pretended to be Zeno and to be Epictetus and wrote all these treaties under their name that they now have, and they call the false Zeno and all stuff like wow. that. I don't think it was done maliciously, yeah. but it was a way to kind of bring the two together mm. um, because they're very conducive. You know, Jesus, whether you are Christian or just look at him as a historical figure, was all about doing good deeds and being a good person. Right. Right. That's stoicism too. Right. Um, yeah. So I think that, that, and then of course, during the Renaissance, part of the, or really the Renaissance was bringing back a lot of these ancient philosophical Greek doctrines, from Socrates to all that, and then merging it into, at that time, modern Christian thought. Yeah. That was, I mean, that's, that's the Renaissance. So there's always, and you know, I mean, Gilbert Murray said, the historian said, essentially after Alexander, everybody, every one of his successors uh, considered himself a Stoic. Hmm. So there was a time when it was like, of course I'm a Stoic. I mean, that's Western philosophy. That's what that's what we do, right? right. Um, anyway, but now it's making a resurgence, which is really good. And I know a lot of the guys and gals, you know, from Ryan Holiday, I've been on his uh, podcast, mm -hmm. Daily Stoic, to, uh, you know, Donald Robertson, uh, who uh, writes often about Marcus Aurelius and Socrates, but Stoic, and then Nancy Sherman, you know, that Georgetown professor who right. wrote the Stoic Warrior. And um, there's a, there's people like that leading the charge. And I think it's a great thing. You know, people like, oh, now it's becoming trendy. It's like, look, man, there's a lot of things to become trendy that are worse than Stoicism, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, oh, it's trendy to be, you know, to, to, to hold wisdom and justice and courage and <laughs> Self-discipline. Yeah, I mean, if that's thing. what kids are doing nowadays, like let's let's promote it, yeah. you know. So uh, anyway, yeah, I think it's a good thing that modern stoicism is taking off. Mm -hmm. One thing you mentioned earlier, and I'd love to maybe highlight, is uh, you said that some early Christians would perhaps write something in the name of I don't know a famous Stoic. I think that's when you, this is something called I think a pseudepigraphy, right? When you write something and you try to impersonate a famous figure. Uh, you, know, you, you try to do that because people will probably believe this more since it was written by you know famous figure, but obviously it wasn't. Um, and that's that happens a lot in the ancient world, I think. Um, but another thing you mentioned, yes. yeah, and something else I, I, I love you brought up is um, the influence, right, on on, on Christianity, uh, Stoicism, or maybe even the ancient, you know, the ancient Greek world might have had a little bit of an influence, and I think. Um, one element, and I think maybe that's something you, you can speak through, is the idea of the separation of the soul and the body. Because I think in the early, earlier before the emergence of Christianity, I think um, Jewish people who also, some of them converted after the emergence of Jesus, believed in in the union of the body and the soul. Like they're, these two are not separate. But then afterward, um, and obviously they believe in the idea of the resurrection where, you know, the, the body rises up, rises back up. And so with, with the influence of the ancient Greeks on the, you know, Christianity, there's, there's the idea of the separation of the body and the soul. So the soul is independent or a different entity than the body. 
Um, and I don't know if that's something you notice or something you, you can speak to, like this level of influence. Sure. And to start with one of your points on your first is uh, about historical documents not being written by the actual person. I mean, that's most of the gospel. Mm. <laughs> I'm sure my wife didn't hear me on that. Um, <laughs> Let's keep it down. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, you look at most historians, just Google Google the, you know, the, the key gospels and you'll see that the, historically that they were written long after the, mm. uh, the actual listed apostle was no longer with us. Um, but that doesn't mean they didn't carry down the stories. But anyway, uh, uh, to your point, I think, I think there's always been an evolution of uh, religion and science. Right. So the more we know, the more we adapt uh, our beliefs as a group, yeah. not just, you know, one particular sect or anything like that. I mean, think about it. There was a time when uh, religious figures figured, said the earth was the center of the universe. Mm. Had to be. Yep. Right. I mean, it was us, just us. Everything, everything else didn't matter. Um, that evolved, you know, Copernicus. All, I mean, we could just go down the list yeah. and eventually, you know, Science figures it out, and the church finally goes, okay, you're right, we're not the center of the universe. Okay, we're not the center of this. this you're not even the center of the solar system. Right. Okay, you know, and then, we, and then, you know, Hubble, I mean, why does he name the, the uh, telescope. telescope after yeah. him? It's because he figured out we're not even, I mean, one galaxy. Right. There's billions of galaxies. So, you know, and, I, and I, the reason why I bring that up is you eventually learn, look, you know, the body decays. It's a natural process. It doesn't, it doesn't you know... The question then becomes about the soul. Is the soul separate? And if the soul is separate, then you can still see how it could eventually join something else or be uh, uh, everlasting. Yeah. You know, it's up to people to make a decision. But I, I think it's pretty clear just from science if you dug up, uh, you know, a grave that you could see what actually happens to the body. It's a natural process that, uh, in, in a way, you could look at it as regenerative. Right. right. Everything's regenerative. If you want to look at it that way. But if, as far as the soul, it doesn't necessarily uh, answer the question of what happens to the soul. Mm, yeah. But I think it's. I think I think early Stoics, for that matter, would have would have claimed that it became part of the bigger entity that was, in their terms, uh, God. Yeah. But I don't want to get too far into that because that's somebody who studied <laughs> studied uh, you know Stoicism at its very roots. Yeah. And not just the the guys that uh, it's a hobby, right? But I think for the most a part, big one, mm. yeah, yeah. For the most part, I think it's all you know. With ancient Greek philosophy, there's a heavy emphasis on sort of feeding the soul or the or the mind, right? You, you um, love of love of wisdom, I mean, or seeking wisdom, or, or trying to um, essentially uh, not necessarily seek gratification but you're trying to feed something else something I intrinsic or something metaphysical in a way it's not it's not the, necessarily the body it's something else so there's there's also that heavy emphasis mm -hmm. um and, yeah, so, and so it seems to, to be it. important let's steal, I'm gonna steal that next time i'm gonna steal that, that was good <laughs> yeah no, i'm learning from you i, I <laughs> i'm just trying to keep uh, up <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was well played yeah, but essentially, I think there's a, a great deal of emphasis on the soul as well back then, you know, because they seem to think that, sure. you know, it's it's more than just your body. It's something else, you know, um, which I think even today, it's it's a prevalent or common theme of wanting to seek something more that transcends instant gratification in a way. Yeah, I think while you're here on Earth and hopefully, you know, for most people, or a lot of people, um, the idea that something comes after, yeah, and, and and for that person, for you, not just you know for existence, which obviously you no know, something comes after. Mm. That's the question. That's the eternal. I don't know that any philosophy answers the question or religion. I guess for some people in the religion it does, but the philosophy is more about the question than necessarily the answer. Mm. It is like you already said, a lover of wisdom. That's literally what philosophy means, right? So it's it's a person who continuously seeks the answer, but maybe would be also be the person that accepts that there isn't a definitive answer, at least not for people here on Earth. Yeah. What do you? Uh, we're we're uh, have you reached that limit of uh, words for the day? Or 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, Abdullah. I told I told for people who listen. I told Abdullah that as you get to be a older man, I think probably uh, it might be gender related. Uh, you get a word count, <laughs> and when you hit the word count, you just kind of stop talking. <laughs> yeah, we don't want you to reach. That I don't know. Point. Is it just me? I don't know. <laughs> like, put a comment in the thing whether it's just me, but I've heard other older men uh, refer to these uh, this phenomenon. Yeah. Or you just run out of words for the day. No, I'm not there yet. I could keep talking. Yeah. No, I figured to uh, ask a couple more questions and see where, uh, and then we can, you know, wrap up this great conversation. Um, is there a way where you see maybe this goes back a l- earlier to our, um, I guess the beginning of our conversation? Uh, is there hope that you have for? the escalation in the region at this stage. Um, obviously, you know, Israel is involved with Iran. Iran is also, um, there's, there's a back and forth between the two countries. Israel is involved in Lebanon and Gaza. It seems to be, I don't want to say getting out of hand, but, it, you know, it's, it's somewhere in that realm of, uh, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. We, what sort of hope do you have for uh, the escalation so that's a certainly a fair question. Um, the issue, as I see it, is tied to the discussion we had early on. What's the plan for the next step? Because mm-hmm. um, if there's no pathway to that, then I think a lot of the groups involved, whether it's obviously Israel, um, Hezbollah, Hamas, Houthis, um, view it as like, this is what we do. We just fight. We just fight. I don't think Israel thinks that way, but the other groups, their existence. I mean, they're, I mean, look at the Houthis, death to Israel, death to the U.S. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of their existence. Right. So I don't know if we can get them off of that, but certainly if you create a political situation where, in this case, Palestinians uh, feel like they have a future, um, that they can safely exist, that they can educate their children and have an economic uh, path forward, then I think the idea that they would be resisting would be resisting what? You, you, you just, you know, embrace your own future. Yeah. The, 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 the groups that, you know, basically benefit by uh, keeping them in this perpetual state of conflict will never agree, but maybe ultimately there's more regular people than there are militants or terrorists. That's one way to get it is for the group. The, and it, this isn't just philosophical, like political, like people have to actually throw in money. Like it's going to take fifty billion dollars. I heard at a, one of the conferences I was at to rebuild Gaza uh, in ten to fifteen years, if that, maybe twenty. So it's going to be more than rhetoric. It's going to be more than tweets, harsh tweets from the UN. It's going to be like a all-out concerted effort to change the current situation and to ensure that Israel feels safe, which they don't. With a lot of the rhetoric coming from countries and, uh, quite frankly, the UN. So. Um, there's a lot of people that are really comfortable being on a political side, one or the other, but are doing almost nothing. Yeah. I mean, really almost nothing. Uh, the tweets don't count. And so, <laughs> I mean, for example, and I, and I, and I, you know, for, I mean, this is an example. It's a small one, but I'll throw it out there. There's a lot of people that were very rightfully concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. And then when the U S pushed a pier from Virginia to Gaza, cost them $230 million. All they do is criticize. Mm. My question is, what the hell are you doing? Right? So they, there's plenty of things to be critical of the peer. But you're know, sitting on the sidelines and having conferences about how terrible the situation is, tweeting about how terrible it is, passing resolutions about how terrible is nothing. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, we could tie this into stoicism. Right. It isn't just saying you're, you know, one of uh, Aurelius's most famous quotes is, you know, enough about talking about what it is to be a good man be one uh you know enough of talking about what it is to be a, a good country yeah be one i'm gonna start right? using so that. there's a lot of, there's a lot of rhetoric and very little action by countries yeah. around the world and i think you know i mean i am getting on a soapbox here but uh, i think that's part of the solution is okay so how much are you willing to throw in to reconstruct us how much are you willing to put in your political capital capital to push all sides of the conflict to get to a political and diplomatic solution. Because the answer is nothing. 
And you're, you know, not the critic that counts. It's the, you know, the country and the arena, to use another quote. From a stoic, <laughs> right? So Teddy Roosevelt. See, I can always go back to those. Teddy Roosevelt used to carry around uh, copies of the notebook, of the handbook by Epictetus. In fact, they brought it on his uh, famous trip down the uh, Amazon. Oh. But, um, right? So, but that's a quote that's also relevant. Yeah. You know, it's not the critic that counts. It's the, in his case, he said the man in the arena. I like that. You win or lose. I like There's that. a lot of, lot of groups, countries, people around the world that love talking about their political opinion, but don't do uh, much to actually change the situation. So I think the biggest thing is it's going to be an international effort, effort on multiple facets of this to change the situation so that this isn't a recurring cycle of violence and conflict. Mm. And one other thing you mentioned also in the beginning is the um, the cons- you mentioned there's uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm phrasing it right, but for most of the time, you know, policies don't change, and we don't really talk about them because there's nothing to talk about because this policy didn't change. And here, I mean, uh, in 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 your in your opinion, do you see that as a, as a is it a good thing or a bad thing? And is it even like, you know, accurate to say that it's 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 binary? It's either good or bad, you know, or is there sort of middle ground? Yeah. So it's uh, oh, another good question. So I, I mean, I do think it's wide in the change. So if it if if it is reviewed and says, well, that's still in the interest of the United States, don't change it. Mm-hmm. Don't change it just because you're a Democrat that came in and, and the poor guy was a Republican or vice versa, which happens. Right. Like, well, I disagree. Why? Because he because Obama agreed with. You know, or Trump agreed or whatever, right? So, I mean, if that's the case, that's a bad reason to change the policy. Obviously, it's not. It's about politics and not policy. Yeah. Um, if it is not, I mean, things do change. Circumstances do change. Allies become adversaries. Not much, but uh, adversaries certainly become allies, right? I mean, think of Japan and Germany, right? Mm-hmm. They're some of our closest allies. Um, so we have to change our policies uh, when they ch- when the circumstances changes. But if it doesn't, it's still in our interest. Leave it. I mean, that's one of the things that it's important uh, to point out is if you change things just because it's the other guy, then nobody wants to enter in agreements with us. Yeah. Because I mean, when you think about it, I mean, I, I rarely look at things from Iran's perspective, uh, but they're like, hey, we entered the JCPOA. You, you know, you had all these other countries that did. Uh, you just unilaterally you know, withdrew from it, primarily because it was a different political party in your own system that agreed with it. I'm not saying it was a perfect agreement, but if you don't try to like make it better and, and maintain our pledge as a country, to then why the hell would they enter in again? Exactly. I mean, I mean, they're just like, look, you're going to change it in four years. What's the point of spending two years negotiating it? To have it? So, and again, I, I'm no fan at all of Iran, and I'm pretty hawkish on Iran. But whether it's Iran or not, if we don't have some consistency in our foreign policy, unless it's a treaty, which is really hard to break, but also really hard to get Mm -hmm. and rarely happens, if there isn't a agreement collectively among Republicans and Democrats and independents for that matter, um, like, hey, man, you've got to really have a reason to break an agreement of the uh, or like nobody's going to come to any agreements with us. They're just not uh, because they just don't trust us. Because so anyway, uh, I won't belabor that, but that's one reason why I think this concept of U.S. foreign policy or polit- politics, U.S. politics ending at the water's edge, a famous uh, quote uh, by Senator Vandenberg, should be the policy going forward. But it seems like we're going away from it. It's like politics is infused in every aspect of everything that we do now and that is not healthy and it's not in our own national security yeah well on that note mick thank you for joining me today i really enjoyed our conversation <laughs> glad we did yeah, it yeah thanks Amela. it was a great conversation absolutely man yeah great talking to you absolutely. and i'm glad we got to touch on the stone system yeah yeah absolutely and for those that didn't some of us some of the video is not going to be published but for those who couldn't see it uh your cute little dog approached us and you know or approached you and decided to sleep next to you so <laughs> yeah yes not everybody calls her cute little she is a a half german shepherd and a half yeah. belgian malinois so like the ultimate uh military dog <laughs> but 
Yeah. She will. She's a sweetheart, but she'll also go against the bear for you. So oh, it has here in the backyard. Wow. So, yeah. That's Finley. Awesome. Finley. It actually is Irish for courageous one. Finley. I like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Mick. That was wonderful. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you got a trip going on, so I don't want to keep you in here for you know, a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Great questions, man. You did great prep work, man. Seriously. I do a lot of these and I get interviewed a lot. You well done. Thank you. 